Can I ask uh, David Keirer, Director, Business Development and Stakeholder Relations, Pacific Northern Gas. David, do you have that many friends too? Okay, well, we'll get you some before you're, before you're, come on up, sir, and introduce our next panel, BC Exports. Where do we ship and why? Long-term visions for BC's export community. I know it's a high-powered panel, and we always like to have one at the end of the day. Thank you, and Pacific Northern Gas for being a part of BC NRF. Thank you. That was quite the entourage. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, folks. Real quick intro. My name is David. I work for a great little company called Pacific Northern Gas, your friendly neighborhood natural gas utility in the north, the northeast, and the northwest, providing safe, reliable, and affordable energy since 1968. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'd like to, uh, just a quick show of hands. Do we have any PNG customers in the audience? Quick show of hands. Quick show of hands. Oh, about half the room, awesome. Thank you for your business. I'd also like to acknowledge the 26 indigenous communities in our service areas. We are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and play on your unceded ancestral lands. Thank you. You know, folks, it was kind of chilly last week. I don't know if you noticed. And I think that gave us a really good opportunity to understand the importance of critical energy infrastructure in BC. Pipes and wires, gas and electricity working together to keep people safe, to keep people warm, and to provide the power for the industry that's driving BC's critical export economy. PNG is delighted to be here to sponsor this next panel. You're in for a real treat. We're going to talk all about export opportunities for the amazing natural resources the British Columbia has to offer to the world. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce the President and CEO of the BC Business Council, Laura Jones. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're good. Bill, write them all. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I cannot think of a better way to... Oh, I think they've turned it on now. You good? Yeah, okay, good. Well, I cannot think of a better way to anchor uh, today and to anchor the BC Resources Forum than a panel on exports because resources are such heavy hitters when it comes to BC's exports. So close to half of what we export in British Columbia comes from our resource sectors. And if you add gateway services in, Ken, that's two thirds. We come up to two thirds. So we've got the heavy hitters on stage here. I'm gonna do a really quick round of introduction, but if you're interested in the longer bios, those are in your Whova app. Um, so sitting next to me, uh, to my left is Brian Cox and with Patronus, and then we've got Tim McEwen with the Mining Association of British Columbia. We've got Ken Veldman with the Prince Rupert Port, and of course we've got David Trent with Ken Canfor. And together, um, we are going to try to do justice to today's uh, last panel, Where Do We Ship and Why? Vision for BC's Export Economy, or I like to shorten this panel to just Exports Rock. Um, and so I think we're going to start with, as we were preparing for this panel, we were talking about how before we talk about where we ship, we really should talk about grounding ourselves in the basics of why exports are so important to British Columbia. And the Premier said it well yesterday, the resource sector is really important to all British Columbians. Um, but I'm going to ask our panelists as they do a brief introduction and make any other introductory comments uh, that they'd like to reflect on why exports are important to all British Columbians. Why are they important to the lovely folks who checked us into all of the hotels as we were coming into Prince George, uh, to my hairdresser, to the supermarket clerk, in the Lower Mainland. Uh, why are exports so important to all British Columbians? And I'm going to um, start with you, Brian. Great. Can you hear me? Great. 
Everybody, congratulations. You've made it through the whole day almost. Uh, we're right at the end. Wine and beer will be coming soon. Uh, you just got to get through this. So thank you for your patience and getting through the day. It's been an amazing day, hasn't it? Like it's the continuity and the clarity of purpose that's coming out of this room is absolutely fantastic. And I think it's been mentioned, you know, we got to, we're in this room, we're having this dialogue. We got to go out of the room and we got to go back to our communities. We've got to keep advocating. We got to keep pushing because as we're seeing out there in the world, it's a scary place right now. We're seeing things that we haven't seen in, in generations happen in the world. Supply chains are, are, are shifting. Geopolitics are shifting. And Canada has a role to play in the world. And we have to decide that right now. We get to decide that right now. What will Canada's role be in the world? Will we continue to be the helper nation that we've always been? Will we continue to step up and be there for our allies? For our allies? I think the answer is yes. We're showing that demonstrably today. We see it with projects like the LNG Canada project. It's our opportunity to get out there and play our part in the world with our natural resources. That is our advantage, and that, uh, that is our opportunity moving forward, which is the great part about this panel. So just quickly, uh, Petronas Canada, that's who I represent. Again, I've been, this is about, I think, my 11th year at this, at this conference, and I'm on my third sector, so I'm uh, excited to see where I, where I head next. I'm not going anywhere because I'm happy here at Petronas Canada and the upstream <laughs> natural gas uh, industry because we've got so much to share and do right now. Uh, so Petronas Canada, we are the subsidiary of Petronas Global, which uh, for all those of you who follow F1, you probably know the logo. For those of you who've been to Calgary uh, in the recent future, it's the newest logo on our building in, in Calgary. It's a statement from this company that we are here and we are invested here in Canada. This, co this company is here as foreign direct investment for a reason. It sees the potential in this uh, country, in British Columbia, to play its part in the world in providing reliable, affordable, sustainable energy to the world. Uh, in Petronas Canada, we, we, we operate uh, our upstream assets only in British Columbia. We see this generation, this opportunity in the Montney to keep responsibly growing this resource and uh, serving domestic customers and importantly uh, into the export. That is why we took the investment uh, as one of the JV partners in the LNG Canada project. That's why we're so excited about that project starting and more LNG to come. And uh, really, really excited to be a part of this dialogue today. I'll stop there, Laura, and we can continue the dialogue. Thanks. That's great. Uh, Tim, why do exports rock? I ask, I'm asking the right guy this, right? The well, you guy? are. Uh, the, the word rock is great because it uh, pertains to mining. But um, yeah, listen, it's a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to be back here in Prince George. Uh, I spent four years here mid-career running the Economic Development Authority uh, here at Initiatives Prince George. And uh, no city in uh, northern British Columbia has as important a hub role to build a knowledge-based resource economy that's connected to the world. And uh, it's great to be with Ken Veldman, who I worked with uh, uh, over uh, some considerable time here as well. Um, in our sector, we have uh, currently 17 operating mines, two world-class smelters, a cadre of advanced development projects that um, uh, cumulatively kick off a supply chain spend of about $3.8 billion over nearly 4,000 companies in every corner of the province, and uh, that's, uh, and that's, or every corner of the province, and about 200 communities, both First Nations and local communities benefit. Those first dollars from export are critical to providing the, the basic income that uh, basically is, uh, uh, Laura's colleague David Williams did a great little study that talks about uh, resource industries being the Clydesdales, that, that, that pull the rest of the economy along. And what we need to do in British Columbia is add to that. And certainly our industry, and I can get into some of the metrics as we have this conversation, uh, there's an enormous, um, enormous opportunity ahead of us, about $800 billion cumulatively uh, over 24 years with 16 critical mineral projects that are, uh, that are on the horizon. So what we need to do is get the public policy frame right, and we can talk a bit more about that. But that first dollar uh, of export income is critically important, uh, and it's been important for many years. I see Donald McGuinness in the, in the audience, and just last night we were talking about uh, a campaign in the late 1990s where two women in the north, uh, north end of Vancouver Island 
began a campaign that stamped first dollar on five, ten, and twenty dollar bills to get the word out in urban British Columbia about the importance of our export, resource based export economy to the entire British Columbia economy. What a great idea. Ken. Yeah, and, and, and let me follow up on that. And, and, and maybe I'll start by um, just putting the port into the context here. Um, I mean, obviously, we're, we're significantly involved with exports and imports, but, um, you know, our purpose, our internal purpose that as an organization we, we look to every day is to build a better Canada by growing trade. That is our purpose. And by extension, build a better province, build better communities. Uh, and what that refers to is the fact that, you know, trade does improve uh, the standard and quality of, of life. And, and, and let me bring that up to a, a global level. In the last 30 years, so say since 1990, um, the rapid expansion of global trade has reduced global poverty from 36% of the population to 9%. 36% to 9% in just 30 years. That's over a billion people on this planet that have been lifted out of poverty, and that's been attributed to global trade. And everybody's import is somebody else's export. Uh, so I think that, that, that kind of backs that up. You know, in, 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 in Prince Rupert, as, as we've seen, you know, significant growth over the last little bit, um, you know, Natural resource exports is a big portion of what we do. Uh, we ship it in containers, we ship it in dry bulk, we ship it in liquid bulk. Um, you know, last year we did about 25 million tons of cargo. Uh, that's worth um, approximately $50 billion worth of goods uh, that were shipped. Uh, we got $2 billion of investment coming in 2024 to continue to expand that capacity and, and, and capabilities. Um, and, and I want to give a shout out to the BC Business Council here. Uh, for those of you who have not read, and I believe it's called A Review of BC Exports, scintillating title, obviously written by an economist. Uh, Ken and Jock did a fantastic job on this. Um, and one of the, the pieces within that is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek reference that every politician from a federal, provincial, down to a municipal level should cut out some of the graphics within there and hang it on their wall. Um, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, 45% of BC exports are natural resource related. 45%, and that's dominated by energy, quite frankly. Um, and I would also note that over half of that comes from northern BC. Um, so very direct piece. And the way economies work is, is a basic income theory of, of economics, which is essentially that it is the goods and services that bring in dollars from outside of your economy that form the basis of it the economic engine. And then the, you know, the, the services and goods that are provided as on a supply basis make up a secondary level. And then you've got wages that go towards retail and food and beverage, and that's your tertiary level. That's how economies work. And exports are at the very basic foundation of that by definition. They are the economic engine. Thanks, and we're thinking about having mugs made with that particular graphic of the, the exports, because exports really do rock. Um, David. Exports do certainly rock. Um, hi, I'm David. I'm from CAM4, and uh, I'm responsible for the supply chain and, and technology at the company, but I'm also uh, trained in economics, and I'll just say I love the multiplier effect, and I think that's what we're here to talk about. I want to spend a few minutes just talking about the forestry industry here. It's wonderful to be in Prince George. It's home. Uh, we have deep roots in this community, uh, and we have had deep roots in this province for over 85 years. Uh, the BC's forest industry has long been integral to the economic and social prosperity of this province. It employs more than 50,000 direct workers and over 50,000 indirect workers, uh, well over 10% which are Indigenous. We're world leader in sustainable forestry. So our forests are managed obviously for multiple values from environmental to social and economic. And each year the industry harvests just less than 1% of the actual working forest land base. And that land base represents less than 0.2% of the actual forests in this province. And not only do we harvest, we regenerate. So all of the harvested areas are replanted, 
and we monitor those for up to 20 years to ensure that we have a healthy forest that is growing on its own and sustaining itself for the future. Our BC forest workers, our members of the community, are super proud to participate in this industry. It's creating low carbon, climate friendly products that are in demand around the world. Um, being a multinational company, we hear from our customers about the quality of BC forest products and the demand for them. Uh, some of those products, of course, stay right here in Canada. Um, we ship, ship our BC made lumber, pulp, paper all around the world to large markets in Japan, other Asian countries, including China, and of course, south of the border to the US. And those exports account for nearly $20 billion uh, in, in forest products exports. And that supports those 100,000 good family supporting jobs that we have in this sector. It also supports over $4 billion in government revenue and nearly 10,000 local businesses. So Canfor spent well over a couple billion dollars in the last decade here and invested in BC. We've recently announced a $200 million rebuild with the latest and greatest technology in our Houston facility. Um, and we've also, and you heard this morning with the Lysella Venture, in terms of our bio innovations, we're in investing in bio products for, for exports, bio composites, and certainly we are investing in technology. Um, one investment that we've made here in BC with technology that was customized you know, from an idea in, in Europe is to instrument all of the harvesting equipment that, that our contractors use. It helps those businesses grow, thrive, and be productive. It also helps us understand for our customers exactly the products that are getting created in the field. So a huge shout out to our partners, Mosaic, Lim Geomatics, UBC, and of course, uh, Sufi Pages here in the, the digital supercluster. Um, certainly, Premier EB um, did acknowledge the, uh, the shortage of cost competitive fiber and the challenges that we have here. Uh, in BC, we have, we have become amongst the highest cost jurisdictions in the world. Um, and while COVID years, when everybody was building a deck, was great for the business, um, certainly with affordability where it is today and high interest rates, we are forecasting that to be long and, 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 and a protracted downturn. Um, and unfortunately, that's forced us to curtail some operations, which is, uh, which is not great for BC's economy and it's not great for this community and many, many others. Um, so it can't be, you know, I think underscored enough. This is an ex Canada is an export country. This is an export province, and certainly the forestry industry is an export industry. Um, and ensuring that it is vibrant and competitive is really critical to the health and long-term prosperity of our province. Great. Well, I'm going to put the next question to you, Ken, and I just want to make sure that we cover off the topic of the panel, which is where do we export? So could you give us a little uh, overview of what goes out of the port? Where does it go? Well, the long answer, is, well, the short answer is all over the place. Um, the, the more specific answer is it obviously depends on what product we're talking about. And, and, and you know, when you look at the Port of Prince Rupert, um, you know, mining products, coal, metallurgical coal in particular, um, forest products, agricultural product, plastic resins, um, most of that is bound for Japan, Korea, or China would be our, our three largest markets without a doubt. Um, that being said, depending on the, uh, the product, we're certainly seeing um, you know, more move into Southeast Asia and, and, and more of what you would call the Indo-Pacific. Uh, certainly South America is, is an element of that. And, uh, uh, and that being said, via the Panama Canal, um, depending on the product, and wood pallets would be a great example, although they're starting to see a, a growing market in Asia as well. Um, it, there's a product that was primarily bound for uh, uh, Europe and the UK in particular. Any other panelists want to weigh in on that one, or did Ken cover the territory? You're good? Okay, um, because I want to get to some of these great Hoover questions, and um, please uh, feel free to add your questions to the lot. I'm going to combine one of the questions we had talked about as a group uh, with one that's coming in on Hoover, and the one that uh, is coming in on Hoover is that, um, oh gosh, they do bounce around. Um, how can you discuss the export? How the export industry plays a role in business opportunities and job creation within the province? But I'm just going to expand on that a touch. 
Um, affordability was raised um, just a moment ago here and has been raised a number of times um, um, last night. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, the Premier mentioned it. Affordability is, I think, the top concern and preoccupation of most British Columbians. And what's getting a lot of um, attention, obviously, and for good reason, is inflation, price increases, people seeing the price of cucumbers going up from 99 cents to 3.99 at the grocery store, and having a lot of uh, sticker shock when when it comes to the price piece of it. But affordability really has two components. It has the prices of the things that you pay and then the incomes that you make. And that's why I want to tie it into this question about um, job creation and opportunities. And we know that, again, export led industries uh, tend to have higher wages. Um, so I just wanted to ask um, each of you, and you've each touched on it a little bit, but maybe you can really double down on this or elaborate, um, is, is where, where are there opportunities um, in your various sectors or from the port do you see um, to help with the top line on the affordability, to help with the income side of affordability? Um, so where are there opportunities there? And then I'm going to come back in a minute and talk about challenges or risks to those opportunities. Um, but let's start with the opportunity side. Any of you want to volunteer to go first? Anyone leaning in? All right. Uh, we'll start at the we'll start at sure. the end and we'll m move sure. our way. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll start off. Um, and first off, super happy that we talk about income um, uh, because certainly with more income affordability uh, concerns diminish. So so what do we need to do from an export perspective um, and from a development perspective here in British Columbia? I mean, I think if we want income, and that is whether it is income to an individual, income to the community. Um, it needs investment or it needs a customer. Um, and if I'm a customer, I am looking for certainty. Certainly in our industry, I'm looking for certainty in terms of um, the product, um, the quality of that product, and the viability of that business over the long term. I'm going I'm to look for eff effectively the same things as an investor. So I think, I think certainty is a big aspect of, of generating consistent income and being able to lever the, the, the higher end of that income. Um, and then it's competitiveness, right? So, so we can grow our margins with higher quality products. And certainly I, um, I can guarantee you when I, when I look at my colleagues here at the table and, and we look at that round log, we're, we're trying to find the highest possible opportunities out of that round log for every single piece of it. Um, and, and there are opportunities around the world that we continue to think about, whether that is exporting our high quality clear lumber uh, to Japan where there's extremely high demand and prices paid for that lumber, or whether it is new opportunities that will also help address housing affordability in terms of modular and mass timber to grow the demand for our products, which of course is going to increase prices. Um, so we need to be competitive and we need to drive certainty, bottom line. Great. Ken, what opportunities are you seeing to, uh, to lift the top line? Well, and, and, and I guess I'll, I'll build on that a little bit, right? I mean, um, you know, opportunities, whether it be business opportunities, increased wages, I mean, there's a, there's a direct correlation there to productivity. Um, and, uh, you know, export industries have always led the way in terms of the strongest productivity levels within the country, and certainly BC is no, no uh, uh, exception to that. Um, and productivity is driven by investment. So when we talk about getting the policy right, ensuring that we're attracting investment, that's what we're talking about, right? That's what investment drives. Um, you know, and, and the other element is scale. You know, what exports provide are the ability for smaller companies to become bigger companies, right? That's, that drives productivity. Um, and, and so those are, are really key elements. And, and you know, and, and you mentioned earlier, Laura, I mean, ports are actually an export, we're an export service, right? We compete internationally um, for those dollars to, to come in from international customers. Uh, and we compete against, you know, other ports throughout North America, quite frankly, in terms of being that gateway. Um, and, uh, you know, what that ends up driving in that export piece, um, because of the high productivity and scale we've been able to achieve, we've got an average wage of $100,000. Um, average. Like, it's, it's, it's significant. And, uh, and, and, and that's what drives it. So when we talk about that important of, importance of export industry and being that 
economic engine and that foundation to do it. Um, prioritizing that as and really understanding that that is the foundational element, that's what really drives that, uh, that uh, um, wealth generation opportunity. And I don't mean that in a corporate sense, quite frankly. I mean that in an individual sense, um, you know, within our, uh, within our province. Also drives revenue for government. Absolutely. Tim. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, just last week, we released a, uh, an economic impact report, and I alluded to it a little bit earlier, uh, that looked at 16 uh, critical mineral mines uh, or extensions. There's 14 critical mineral mines plus two extensions. And the, uh, the short-term construction impact is $36 billion if they were all to go. Uh, there's 300,000 person years of employment and $11 billion in tax revenue that would, uh, would spin off from that. So, you know, there's enormous opportunity in the short run. Uh, not all of those will, will, will go, uh, but if you, you got most of them, that would be a tremendous lift in the, uh, in the, uh, the productivity of, of British Columbia, would provide that basic export income. And, you know, Ken mentions $100,000 $100, of uh, an average income in his sector. It's 139000 in mining. And uh, that's before you have the spin-off jobs that, uh, that go through the supply chain. Thanks. Yes, uh, I mean, agree with all of these comments uh, from my esteemed colleagues here on the panel. And I think, I think the, the point I would add is around community, like obviously the incomes that in our industry are, you know, amazing and, and communities that require them. And it's really about communicating our economy. I think we've been uh, really siloed in how we talk about our economy in years past. I think we're changing that. I think it's all happening within this room. I think, you know, Colleen Sweet, who was on the stage last night, who did the trust survey uh, with iTotem, has worked with each of our sectors act on supply chain studies. Uh, they're out there with my MABC, with Kofi, uh, and one was done with the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, just showing $4.7 billion of procurement from upstream natural gas in BC in 140 communities. Every community is a resource community, and I think that's our opportunity is, is having that conversation. Uh, a really interesting study was done at the Canadian LNG Alliance uh, where we, we said, what would happen if, uh, if all the LNG projects went forward? What would that do to the Canadian economy? And it was all those multiplier jobs. And do you know the province that benefited the second most after British Columbia? from developing LNG in BC? Anyone have a guess? No? It's Ontario. Ontario is the province that benefits the second most because of how our supply chains and economy work. We have to connect our economic dialogue together in this country to make it relevant and real for people who are struggling with affordability, healthcare, housing, and make it real for them to go oh yeah, we need to double down on these export industries that we have. Okay, Brian, I, I can't resist. I have to um, go to the question that I uh, was going to ask a little bit later, but I, just following up on that theme around the importance of communication, everyone in this room understands the importance of the resource sector. Um, we're not the ones who need convincing. Um, do you think British Columbians understand the importance of exports generally and the resource sectors specifically to our economy? And if not, how do we make that case that you just made that every community is a resource um, community? Going back to me on that one. No, no, they don't. Uh, people are just trying to get through their day as we all know and they're, they're, they're struggling. Every, we all see it every day, we all feel it ourselves and uh, everyone's so divided. Uh, you don't know what to believe. There's information coming in. You've got a computer in your hand all day long just feeding you information. You don't know what to believe, what's right. So we have to cut through that noise as an industry, and we need to connect people to each other again. And that's what this industry, what our industries do. So we connect people to each other all day long and make that relevant again as to what is our purpose as a province and as a country. What are we doing? And how do we put our shoulders to the wheel together to achieve those? So I think we've got a lot of work to do to, to continue that dialogue. We really need to connect with our urban communities who are particularly in BC, which is such a unique jurisdiction when it comes to natural gas, where it's produced in the far northeast of the province. It's about as far away as you can get, as we know from 
from Vancouver and, and the island. And so it's really, there's that extra work that needs to be done to make those connections. I think we're working really hard. I really credit the, all of our sectors for, for uh, get, trying to get ahead of it over the last few years, but we've got lots of work to do. Um, so is there a silver bullet to it? No, but we just got to keep at it. We got to make, uh, make it relevant and real and simple and understandable and human. Got to make it human. Certainly reminding ourselves of those opportunities at events like this is part of the solution. Um, but uh, those of us who appear from the lower mainland know how important it is to, uh, uh, to, to get that message out in the lower mainland. Any, anyone else want to weigh in on that? Tim, I see you leaning yeah, in. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in on that. You know, one of the things that um, those of us who are in our, their mid-50s or older will recall is that in the lower mainland, uh, there used to be visible signs of the res more visible signs of the resource economy on the Fraser Estuary. There used to be more mills. There were more loadout facilities, uh, and so forth. So, you know, it's it's not like uh, I grew up in uh, in the West Kootenay and uh, in Trail, and the, the smelter dominates the town. The export economy is 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 there. It's in front of you. It's here in Prince George when you look at the mills across the the pulp mills across the river. And it's, it's the work of, of, of every day, as Brian sort of points out. This conference is fundamental in getting the message out about the importance of BC's resource economy uh, down in the Lower Mainland, where a lot of the decisions, uh, rightly or wrongly, are made with respect to, uh, to the resource industries. Yeah, and I would even build on that. I mean, you know, about 15 years ago, uh, there was a real estate study, study done on downtown Vancouver. Um, and I believe 80% of the square footage in downtown Vancouver was actually linked into natural resource industries. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I wouldn't say that economic connection has been lost, but I think the understanding of that That's has correct. been lost. Yeah. Um, and, and with all due respect to my urban colleagues, um, you know, uh, I think I can say with, with relative confidence that you know, certainly smaller communities, northern BC, I think there's still very much, you know, a strong support base for natural resources. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's still more, to, more work to do, even in northern BC, in understanding the export element of that, because I think that's actually the criticality to it. It's not so much a natural resource piece, as that natural resources are such a big part of our export profile. There's many other services and industries within the, within the province that, that also fit that bill. Um, you know, um, and, uh, um, you know, even, you know, Premier Eby's comments last night, I think, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're definitely hearing the support for natural resources, but understanding that it's the economic engine, everything else flows off of that, the connection into government revenues, how that ties back into investment into those industries to compete on a global stage, ensuring that you've got the supply chain to be able to deliver it into those markets in a certain and reliable way um, are absolutely key to this. And, and any economic policy, that has to be the foundation of it. Basic economic education around things like exports in our schools would go a long way, or getting back to that, because I think we used to have more of that. Okay, I'm going to hit some of these questions. There's uh, clearly one uh, uh, addressing uh, for you, David, on Canfor. Does Canfor plan to begin uh, the so, upgrades of the Houston facility soon, and um, are there local components, uh, companies capable of undertaking such an innovation? project. Yeah, great. Thank, thanks for that. And, uh, and certainly I can confirm a, a, a few things here. So um, in terms of our Houston facility, uh, it is a sawmill, which always consists for those who aren't in forestry of a sawmill and a planer. So it is a rebuild, uh, a brand new uh, sawmill that we intend to put in place. It will be slightly smaller in terms of the, uh, the actual productive output, and that's more from a sustainability in the local area to support the, the fiber supply that we have there. But to produce um, high value products um, for our customers in Asia uh, and, in, and in the US, so an export mill, if you will. Um, work began immediately after we actually made the announcement in September of 2023. So a lot of work goes into the, to the sawmill in terms of the engineering and the design and the permitting. Uh, that's all underway. 
and certainly uh, the, the, the vendor, the equipment um, selections to be finalized, you know, in the first, first half of 2024 here and demolition and, and preparation sort of pl planned for this year. Um, to answer the second part of the question, um, are there local companies capable of undertaking such an innovative project? Um, absolutely, and certainly um, when we uh, build any facility or do any capital work on uh, our facilities, um, we are utilizing the, you know, the, the trades, the personnel, the people um, that have experience in the forestry industry from this community. Um, and as we go through um, the selection processes, we're certainly going to prioritize those. Thanks. And uh, Brian, here's one that's clearly for you, um, is uh, do you think LNG coming online um, means that natural gas will become uh, BC's biggest uh, export overall? Yes. Uh, Thanks, that was short. Hopefully. <laughs> no, there's an incredible, obviously an incredible opportunity with, with LNG, and I think it, it's important to contextualize, it's a, this is a value chain, right? Uh, upstream natural gas development is key to our LNG opportunity. This is a growth story. And so uh, I think there's a lot of dialogue out there that uh, a perhaps misconception that, you know, the gas that will be going uh, for export and as LNG will be gas that's on the market now. This is, this is growth in gas. This is both servicing our domestic market, uh, which continues to grow as well, and servicing the, the, uh, the export market, which we have a massive opportunity to provide uh, low emission LNG to. So it's, a, it's an incredible value chain opportunity that LNG provides. We're very close to being that, export, that LNG exporting country, and I think it's gonna really change the dynamic when it comes to our natural gas industry in Canada. And uh, you know that's really what we try to talk about every day. This is a responsible growth opportunity that, that comes with uh, great opportunities to abate carbon, uh, and that investment uh, drives innovation. So, and growth drives innovation. So, um, you know, we're very excited, obviously, about LNG Canada coming online, the other projects, uh, the, the incredible opportunity for Indigenous communities all across the value chain. And trustfully, that, it, that comes to fruition and continues to, and, and natural gas becomes uh, that number one exporting commodity. Thanks, and Tim, there's uh, clearly one for you here. Mining, will the increase of carbon tax from $65 um, uh, going up from there, is that going to, from $65 a ton to $80 a ton, negatively impact foreign capital investment? And I mean, more broadly, all of you are in sectors that are very um, competitive. I mean, export sectors also have to compete with countries around the world and the conditions in those countries around the world. So Tim, I'll start with you, any comments on that? And then if anyone else wants to jump in, feel free. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, so BC's mines and smelters already pay uh, amongst the highest carbon uh, taxes in the world, uh, although we have some of the lowest emission profiles. And the government of British Columbia is uh, currently looking at revising the carbon pricing system to an output-based pricing system. And we've um, really been making the case very strongly that there needs to be uh, a competitive uh, or a carbon price in British Columbia that's competitive with Ontario and Quebec, that's on par with Ontario and Quebec. So uh, we start there. We need to be competitive uh, domestically, uh, and we also have to keep a, keep a clear line of sight on our international uh, competitors as well. Most mining companies have a portfolio that the uh, portfolio of options that they, they have uh, when they, they look at where they're going to deploy capital. And, and in doing so, uh, we need to, to be competitive within that frame. Thanks. Anyone else want to weigh in on competitiveness? Anything keeping you up at night when it comes to competitiveness? Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll even kind of frame that off of the sustainability piece. Um, you know, su supply chains, transportation involved with that are, are obviously significant contributors globally uh, in terms of carbon emissions. Um, and, you know, support for, for exports, global trade in the middle of a climate crisis, there's no doubt that, you know, logistics needs a climate neutral future. And that is a big ask for, you know, especially when you start talking about ocean going vessels, et cetera, in terms of, of difficult to abate, it's, it's, it's the definition. Um, you know, certainly ports as, as a part of that, that supply chain are, are, are a part of that and, and, you know, we are knee deep in terms of moving towards our goals and, and you know, 
a lot of that is, quite frankly, planning and efficiency, uh, new technology and equipment as, as that starts to become commercially readily available, uh, new fuels or, or energy, whether that be alternative fuels, whether that be electricity. Um, but when it comes to the carbon tax, it's also making sure that we're balancing incentives, which are good, uh, with competitiveness, which has to be maintained, um, and, and ensuring that, that, that that's in line. And certainly within the within the export conversation, where we are competing globally with jurisdictions that, that quite frankly, may not have the, probably do not have the same kind of uh, uh, pricing on it, um, it needs to be a part of that, that policy framework um, in, in order to advance forward, because the ironic aspect is that we, 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 for many of our industries, uh, in particular natural resource export industries, we are some of the lowest emission footprints in the world for what we're, we're producing. So losing investment to that is actually going backwards in terms of, of, of addressing the, the, the crisis uh, that we're trying to address. And, and, and that is difficult to do within, within that framework, but um, absolutely has to be a principle. Well, thank you. I think you just hit some of the questions that had come up from the audience um, as well um, as that in our uh, managing the practical realities, maintaining competitiveness while being bold with respect to our ambitions. That is really one of the challenges of our time, I think. Um, so I want to leave each of you enough time to um, leave the audience with one, if there's one thing that you would like people to take away um, from this panel. And um, we don't have a whole lot of time, but if there's anything you didn't touch on that you really want to get in, you can sneak that in too. But the main thing I want you to do is leave the audience with one, one key takeaway. And um, David, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, well, I think I already talked about the, the 100,000 jobs the forest sector supports. Um, but importantly, um, the value that the forest sector puts on the sustainability of our forest and our communities and the need for collaboration to ensure that we we grow uh, the incomes and the wealth of, of our communities and uh, and and customers and uh, and certainly we, we know that that's going to require collaboration um, and that we're in a bit of a crucible of uh, uh, challenging pricing and, and challenging access to resources, but through collaboration, we're going to com be confident that we're going to get through this. Tim, I'm going to go to you. I'll come back to you, Ken. Sure. Um, I'd leave the audience with the, uh, the fact that we're on the cusp of staggering new expert opportunities if we reach out and take those opportunities. And, uh, and in that frame, we need to have a competitive tax and regulatory environment. I mentioned the challenge we have with carbon pricing uh, at this time. Uh, but the opportunities are there for, for all of us. It's, it's government, it's labor, it's First Nations, it's communities, and we all need to work together to, uh, to realize them. And uh, you know, in that supply chain where we began this conversation, it was, you know, what is the effect of exports? It, it trickles right through the British Columbia economy, and uh, there are there are the opportunities there, but they won't just come to us. We have to reach out and be bold and seize the day. Ryan? Yeah, we, 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 we need to work at pace, uh, and we can't work around the edges. Those days are over, uh, and we've talked about it. You've heard it on all of the panels, I think, today. It is time to take advantage of the opportunity that we have in front of us, <clears throat> and it's going to take hard work because we need to change our systems. It takes too long to get things done. It really does for all of the best of intentions and that needs to change now and when we come back to this conference next year we need to see tangible movement and moving at pace on things like electrification there's great commentary great announcements for governments let's go make that happen carbon capture and storage we got to move at pace all of these pathways to abatement and we need in order to make those happen we need to see direct clear pathways to growth they're tied together and ken i'm going to give you the last word uh <laughs> yeah, well, um, look, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, the world has always been dynamic and fast changing, and, and that only seems to be even more so in the last three to four years. Anybody in the, the global trade or supply chain business has, has, has absolutely seen that. You know, we, we need to ensure that, you know, look, from our business, we talk about being more robust, 
being more diverse, being more resilient, being more flexible, ensuring that those kind of options are being offered to our customers in, in ways that they can pivot quickly. Um, and I would imagine that every single company in every single industry are using the exact same words as they go forward. Um, and, 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 and the element to that that is critical um, is that we're too slow. We have to figure out ways to be quicker because it is a globally competitive world. Everybody else totally understands the, you know, the, the value of exports and what that can bring to their societies. Um, we've got to grab it with both hands and, and be able to do that in the windows of opportunity that are there because windows do not remain open for long. Great, and my last words have to do with rocks. So resources rock, exports rock, this panel rocks, um, and this audience definitely rocks for hanging in with us um, as we stand between you and your wine. So thank you very much, everyone. How about a great round of applause? And Laura, special thanks. I was a bit worried when I saw who you had to uh, corral here, but I, I think Laura deserves her own round of applause for excellent moderation. And my new good buddy from Fortescue, <laughs> Joseph Saliba, Manager of Engineering and Projects Canada. Uh, Fortescue, our, one of our diamond sponsors. Give it up for Joseph to thank our panel. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and uh, thank you to the entire panel for your insights on the importance of uh, the BC export market. Um, for our project, our hydrogen project here in Prince George, that importance couldn't ring more true. Uh, you know, the export market um, is essential to our project. Our, the export of our ammonia to the Asian markets not only underpins the project's economic value, uh, but it also allows us to build up the industry while we wait for the domestic hydrogen market to mature. And with one of the cleanest grids in BC, uh, in the world, BC is uniquely uh, and extremely well positioned to be a key player in the green fuel uh, production. And with the ability to export that green fuel, uh, BC can play a key role in not only Canada's GHG uh, emission reduction, but on a global scale, uh, the reduction of GHG emissions. And, and that's kind of why Fortescue is excited about building work here in BC. You know, our goal is the decarbonization of the world in general. Um, and so we're excited to build work here in BC and, and it really couldn't happen without uh, the first, the export market uh, being available to us. So thank you, and thank you to the panel, and enjoy the rest of the forum. Great. Joseph, thank you for hand, everybody. That's for yes, Laura. Of course. And there's the land. So just while Joseph hands out our speaker thank yous, and then Jason's going to take our group photo, I've got a few notices for you just before you sneak away. First and foremost, give yourselves a big hand. Do you know how much you raised for the Outland Youth Employment uh, Program last night? I'm going to tell you, $4,125. Well spent. Money well spent for you. Yeah, take all the photos you want. Now, um, that concludes your program for the day. Of course, we have the meet and greet trade show reception starting right now in 103 next door. And uh, please give a thanks to Echo for Consulting for being our meet and greet reception sponsor for tonight. Thank you, Echo for. Doors open tomorrow morning, 645 here, 645. You don't want to be late for the minister's breakfast. It is always one of the more exciting parts of the BCNRF. Now, I'll just say this for you first timers, especially from Ottawa. Play safe out there tonight. There's more receptions going on tonight in Clayton Country than you can shake a stick at. Uh, but play safe. Get home. If I don't uh, see you home by 9 o'clock, we may have to have a chat tomorrow morning. All right, that's it for Wednesday, January 17th. Have a great night, folks, and we'll see you here first thing in the morning.